into our final presentation of the day. Um, I'm gonna quickly read through some bios here and then let these guys get off and running. First, we've got Sean Fox, principal of Fox Forensic Accounting. Sean brings more than 25 years of experience providing fraud and forensic accounting, dispute advisory and valuation services to the business and legal community. Sean recently started a boutique advisory firm, um, Fox Forensic Accounting to provide the highest quality service on legal and regulatory matters with a more competitive fee structure than traditional accounting and consulting firms. Joining Sean, we've got Tom Morrison, um, who is a CPA and vice president of tax for National Cinemedia. Um, Tom joined them in 2009 and um, is currently also an adjunct professor um, in the University of Denver graduate tax program. Prior to beginning work at NCM, Tom worked for three years at Jefferson Wells. He began his career working for two of the big four national accounting firms and was also tax director for a publicly traded software company. Um, Tom's area of expertise include U.S. multi-state corporation tax, subchapter K taxation, and ASC 740 analysis and compliance for public companies. Um, also, John Haveman, executive director of the National Economic Education Delegation, Dr. Haveman, an expert on economic policy issues and speaks regularly at events across California. His more than 400 talks have covered a wide range of policy topics as well as addressing the state of the US, California and Bay Area economies. Dr. Haveman holds a PhD and Masters of Science in Economics from the University of Michigan and a Bachelor of Science in Economics from the University of Wisconsin. This talented panel is gonna be moderated by Larissa Rapoport, who's a partner with Baker Tilly. Um, in the audit department with a focus in manufacturing and distribution and technology industries. Larissa leads the firm's M&D Industry West and her client base is mostly comprised of consumer goods companies, including food and beverage and SaaS technology companies. Larissa advises clients on accounting for complex transactions, including M&A and coordinates entire value added service offerings for her clients, including tax, R&D, et cetera. Now I'm gonna take a breath and let you guys get off and running. Thanks guys. Thank you, Bill. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much, Tax Forward, for having me and moderate this panel. Uh, the way we're going to structure it, uh, so my, my name is Larissa Rappaport, and I'm going to be moderating this panel. The way we're going to structure it, we're going to have three different um, panelists talk about their area of, uh, areas of expertise, and they have completely different backgrounds and bring a different perspective into this topic of economic look at the shutdown uh, and the recent events that impact the shutdown as well. So we'll start with John Haveman, uh, who is the expert in economic policy. He will uh, talk from a 30,000 feet level from macro, uh, macroeconomic standpoint, uh, where we stand. Then we'll have Sean Fox with the Forensic Tax Accounting Group talk about his clients. And then we'll have Tom Morrison from uh, Cinema Media talk about uh, the impact on their firm. So let's start with John. And as we uh, are having our presentation, feel free to send your questions on either Q&A or chat. And I will attempt to pose them to, to the speakers. To the, to the extent we have time, uh, each speaker is going to have about 10 to 15 minutes to talk. So John, welcome. Thank you, Larissa. Happy to be here. I just... uh, so I have a few questions for you. I may start with a few questions. Feel free to chime in as, as you deem fit and um, bring in your perspective on where things are. So the first question that I have is, uh, what do you think the prospects are for complete economic recovery? And will that happen soon? So Lewis, I've, I've got a, a PowerPoint, if you recall. Why don't I run through the PowerPoint real quick and then we can address those questions with a little bit of background? Sure. Okay. 
uh, so I'll, I'll take it away with, with, uh, with my slides. Um, as, as Larissa mentioned, I'm, I'm kind of the 30,000 foot guy. Um, I give talks on, on coronavirus economics. I'm the executive director of the National Economic Education Delegation. And we're gonna take a little look at you know, some economic indicators for the economy. We'll talk a little bit about policy and then we'll talk just a little bit about uh, what the path forward might look like. Um, it's, a, it's an incredibly uncertain time, um, but I'll offer some, some, uh, some of my thoughts for you. Right, so, so first, uh, let's start by just talking, looking at, uh, GD, at uh, consumer spending. Right, I think consumer spending, and let me say that this is great. You guys are all tax people, so I think you know graphs pretty well, so I won't go into great detail on what they are. Um, but consumer spending is a terrific indicator of what's going on with the economy um, throughout this episode. Right? This graph uh, goes back to January 20 when we first had the first U.S. COVID case. Um, and then uh, we heard, heard about Iran and Italy having lots of cases and people started just staying home. We closed a lot of, a lot of stores, uh, a lot of shelter in place, and consumer spending dropped about 35% uh, from its levels in January. We stayed there only for about two weeks and then we started opening back up. I'll argue that we opened back up way too soon uh, in a few minutes um, and we're st suffering a little bit because of it. Uh, consumer spending is trending downward as the number of coronavirus cases edges upward. So total spending is down about 6% relative to where it was in January. It should be higher than where it was in January, so we may well be down about 10%. If we look at GDP, right, GDP has been this enormous roller coaster, right? So this is a graph on a quarterly basis. Blue bars going up means GDP went up. Red bars going down means GDP went down. This is the global financial crisis of about a decade ago. We thought that was horrendous um, until now. Right, where we got m massive decline in GDP in Q2 of this year. And then the roller coaster took us way back up uh, in Q3 of this year. Right? And so we're, we're on our way to recovery, but we're not nearly there yet. Here's kind of where we are relative to Q4 of 2019, we'll call that 100. In Q1, we're at 98.7, so down 1.3%. Q2 was down 10.1%. Uh, and, and as of now, we're down about 3.5% relative to the end of 2019, but probably 5% relative to where we otherwise would have been, right? Um, so uh, we're still way behind the eight ball. Um, and I don't think that we're going to recover 2019 levels anytime soon as the economy goes back into a little state of retrenchment. We can look at changes in employment. This is a change in employment uh, in each year going back to 1980. Um, and you can see that uh, as of this year, we're down about 6.3 percentage points. Whoops, pardon me. Um, so we've suffered declines this year that are much more significant. We're still down about 10 million jobs, much more significant than even what we, we uh, experienced during the global financial crisis. Look at stock markets. Stock markets are going on as if there's nothing wrong. Um, we had this episode where they dropped about 35%. Right. Again, we started hearing about Iran and Italy and stock markets started going down. The Federal Reserve lowered interest rates, so it went up. Then, then outdoor concerts like Coachella Valley were canceled. March Madness was canceled. NBA playoffs, Major League Baseball season canceled. Um, and then we had the CARES Act uh, in late March that was passed. And stock markets said, oh, okay, government's going to hop in really quick and everything's going to be all right. So they took off and uh, the, the S&P 500 is up more than 10% relative to where it was in January and Dow is up about 4%, right? So the markets have recovered quite nicely. Moving on to policy issues, it's really three different policies. There's social policy, there's monetary policy, and then there's fiscal policy spending by Congress. I wanna spend a couple of minutes talking about social distancing and flattening the curve because <clears throat> I, 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 I find that a lot of people don't really understand the implications of it, thinking that it's designed to get us out of this more quickly when the reality is that it's designed to keep us in a little bit longer, um, but to save lives. So let's, let's take this as the graph of the number of COVID cases on a given day. If we didn't do anything, then it would have ramped up pretty quickly. Um, it would have peaked at a pretty high level, uh, and then it would start coming back down, right? I'm not sure if these questions are showing up for all of you, so I'll just move that, sorry. Um, so that's, that's without protective measures. That's without shelter in place. We'd have a high number of cases at its peak and it would come down quickly, right? And there's a problem with this. And the problem is that the number of cases throughout much of this period would ex exceed our current healthcare capacity, 
right? If it's above our current healthcare capacity, that means that all of these folks are going to be doing without healthcare, and a lot of them will die uh, who wouldn't with some healthcare, right? So we want to flatten the curve, push down on the peak of that. And so we get a curve that looks something like this. I've still not drawn it be below our healthcare capacity because presumably between this time and that time, we'll have made investments in additional capacity, right? So the benefits of doing this are that we save lives um, and we prevent uh, long-term or lifelong health maladies that might result from the virus. And estimates are that that maybe saves five to $6 trillion worth of lives and health. Uh, so that's the benefit of doing it. The cost is that by shutting down, we hurt the economy. Now the economy would have been hurt without protective measures, you know, something like this, something that's you know, not too deep, but, but comes back quickly. But with protective measures, we're shutting the economy down. So it's gonna go really deep trough um, and last longer than it otherwise would have, right? So the difference in these two areas, that's the cost to the economy. And there were numbers put around that maybe the cost of that is about $2 trillion. So we're imposing $2 trillion worth of cost on the economy, saving $5.2 trillion worth of lives. That's a good deal. And that answers the question, is the cure worse than the disease? And economists predict uniformly say that no, the disease, the cure is not worse than the disease. Uh, but that hinges on our doing it right, right? And we're, we're just frankly not doing it right. What we're doing is we're flattening the curve again and again. And this is problematic because this isn't the graph that we end up with. We end up tacking on one of these, right? And then more people are dying because we're getting more cases and we're hurting the economy more, right? So the benefit is getting reduced and the costs are getting increased. So if we keep doing this yo-yo enough times, then uh, the benefits will not exceed the costs. I'm currently optimistic that they still do because the death rate seems to be quite low. Um, but if, if we continue to yo-yo, um, that's gonna be an enormous problem and is really truly a, a, a healthcare policy failure, right? So that's a little bit on flattening the curve. And just here's a, a look at the, the profile of daily cases is from the New York Times, right? And that was our first bump up. Then we went down here and we had Memorial Day and everybody started going out and then we had July 4 and then the cases got up and uh oh, the shut down again. And then we had Labor Day and now uh, we're getting into winter season and number of cases are now double what they were at the previous peak during the summer, right? I'm hopeful that this trend is starting to taper, <clears throat> taper off, but I'm not at all sure. Okay, just a couple of minutes on policy. The Federal Reserve lowering interest rates, shoring up loans, injecting a lot of cash into the system, trying to stabilize the economy and maintain liquidity. We had a lot of social insurance from the Congress. I call it social insurance, not stimulus, um, because it's not designed to stimulate the economy. It's designed to get resources to, to those who need them. And I want to point out that the last time Congress acted was in April, right? And now we're several months beyond what that uh, social insurance was designed to cover. So a lot of hardship is out there, right? Last time Congress acted was April. Unemployment payments are now very low. Low wage workers are bearing the brunt of this. Small businesses are struggling badly. Renters can't pay their rent. Lines at food banks, state and local governments are slashing budgets and employment in state and local governments is down more than the economy is as a whole, right? We can look at small businesses in different sectors of the economy. This is the same as the consumer spending graph. So it's zero in January and deviations are from January. So retail and transportation, 20% of small businesses in retail and transportation are shut down. 22% in education and health services shut down. 42% in leisure and hospitality shut down. Right, so what might we expect? So we're going to get a V or a K-shaped recovery. The V-shaped recovery is something the current administration talks about. We're just going to bounce right back. I don't see that happening. K-shaped recovery embodies the notion that the top of the income distribution is going up and doing just fine, and the bottom of the income distribution is not doing just fine. Um, so we're getting a K-shaped recovery. Um, I'll mention in a minute, so I think it's really more of a Nike swoosh shape recovery that GDP is gonna go, do, went down sharply, came back up a lot, but it's, its upward trend is tapering off. The aggregate data in Q3 looked pretty good because the CARES Act supported low-income workers. Um, people, a lot, a lot of low-income workers had more money to spend than in the absence of coronavirus, so that helped the data. It doesn't look good everywhere. The bottom part of the K, we've got employment of low income workers is hurting. Small firms are hurting. Uh, hard hit sectors, right? the restaurants, entertainment and transportation, they're all hurting. And state and local governments, as I mentioned, are having to slash their budgets. There has to be more social insurance in particular for low income workers and state and local governments. 
Um, and as I mentioned, we're going to have a Nike swoosh re recovery. So it's going to take a long time. It may well be 2029 before the economy gets back to where it otherwise would have been. There are roadblocks to a stimulus package, general aid to state and local governments. Democrats say yes, Republicans say no. What about liability protection for firms against COVID lawsuits? Democrats don't want it, Republicans want it. So we're not gonna get it without that. Can a stimulus bill of more than a trillion pass the Senate? Democrats say yes, Republicans say no. Right, so we're at a bit of a political stalemate that is hurting an enormous number of people. I'm just gonna conclude real quickly um, and then happy to, to move on to the Q&A. All right, so COVID-19, it's a health crisis with huge macroeconomic implications and enormous built-in inequities. Like GDP at the end of this year will likely have contracted between 3 and 6% relative to 2019. Positive growth will be back next year, but not very fast. Um, Government-induced spending and caused the growth in Q3, but that spending has stopped. It's a huge policy gap that's causing enormous hardship, hunger, evictions, and additional deaths from the stress of economic hardship. GDP is lower than it otherwise would be. Unemployment rate is higher than it otherwise would be. And I'll leave you with, the, with this final parting thought. It's about six weeks ago now, maybe two months, that a couple of economists wrote an op-ed in the New York Times saying that what we need to do maybe is just shut the economy down for about four weeks. Shut it down, get the cases under control, keep everybody separated so that the cases are minimized, and then we can come back uh, stronger from both an economic and a health perspective. Right? That might be expensive, but it might be much less expensive than the path that we're currently on. Okay, um, that's what I have, Larissa. I will stop sharing and happy to address your questions. Thank you, John. Uh, that was revealing and uh, not very optimistic. Uh, 2029, uh, that seems uh, a long time from now, nine years from now, or eight years yeah. from now. Yeah, you, that, Larissa, that was an act actually an estimate that the CBO put out in April. Um, and if anything, the picture now is a little bit more dire than it was in April. Um, so, you know, the, the news about the vaccine uh, is wonderful. And I hope that they're as, as well as they're advertised, as good as they're advertised to be, and that they get distributed really quickly. Um, otherwise, we're in for a lot more economic hardship. All right. Yes. Um, so part of me is hoping that uh, you guys are wrong so to, to some extent. But I, I, I hope that I'm wrong every day. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. You talked about stimulus and the need for stimulus, how important it is to have additional stimulus, and we really didn't have anything since April. So what do you think, when do you think is going to come, and what's the likelihood of that, and how big do you think it's going to be? Well, if, if I were a betting man, I would bet that we won't see stimulus until after January 20. Um, you know, my guess is that the, the incoming Biden administration will work hard behind the scenes between now and then to figure out exactly what might pass. Um, and then something will be proposed uh, in, in the wake of, of uh, pre President, then President Biden's inauguration. Um, I honestly don't see any social policy or social insurance or stimulus um, coming between now and, uh, and inauguration day, which, which I think is, is, is really tragic. Yes, it definitely is. And then you mentioned the key recovery, uh, which is uh, really interesting. I, I've not heard about it, uh, key shape recovery. So um, do you think this is just going to enhance and the K is going to grow uh, where the, the upper K is going to go up more significantly and the lower K is going to go down more significantly? I, yeah, I, I think that's probably going to be the case until we have um, widespread vaccinations, right? Mm -hmm. Until we have widespread vac vaccinations, you know, people are going to be using Amazon instead of their local retail. Um, and that has the effect of concentrating wealth enormously. Um, here's, here's a statistic that I learned just recently that now the richest 15, 1, 5, 15 Americans hold more wealth than do the poorest 5, 50%. The bottom half of the, of the wealth distribution has less wealth than the top 15 people. That was not the case before the pandemic. I see, interesting. So we actually have a question in Q&A section, so I, I'm just going to read out of that. Any theories about why the stock market hasn't been driven downward by COVID? Well, yeah, a few of them. Um, one is that there's nowhere else to put your money that's going to make any. Um, so people continue to put their money in the stock market. And in, in the wake of the first CARES Act, when the stock market started going up, I think there was a, a big bandwagon that everybody jumped on. 
and saying, okay, the stock market's going to be okay. And to, to some extent, I think that's fine um, because this is a, this is a temporary hit to com corporate valuations from most companies listed on the stock exchange, not permanent. Um, it's also the case that a lot of small businesses are going out of business. Uh, and uh, the, the, the revenue that they would have accumulated is now going to firms that are listed on the stock exchange. So this, this recession has actually been better for companies that are listed on the stock exchange than most other companies. Thank you, John. Uh, we're gonna move on to Sean uh, just for the sake of time. And then uh, if John, if you can stay, if you have time afterwards, I will ask you a few more questions. Absolutely. Thank you. Sean, very good to have you here. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? I understand you're for this forensic uh, accounting firm. And uh, I have a few questions for you. Uh, so, the, so the first question is, I was just going to pose the question, then, then you can introduce yourself and answer the question. What has been the impact of the pandemic and shutdown on the types of cases that you are working with? Yes, as a forensic accountant, there's been a lot of impact in the cases that I'm working on right now. For example, you know, I do a lot of work on, you know, in litigation cases and insurance claims, and there's been a lot of you know, work in our in our space as a forensic accountant, you know, analyzing those things because, you know, forensic accounting does a lot of work in, you know, calculating damages and uh, insurance claims, lost profits, unjust enrichment, things like that. But for example, like, you know, we're seeing uh, a significant amount of work on insurance claims where there's disputes over the business interruption and other coverages related to property insurance, commercial, general liability, and so on. Uh, unfortunately, with the insurance claim issues, though, um, you know, most companies don't have provisions in their policies for business interruption coverage. There's been a lot of lawsuits, and so far, like, I'm trying to expand the coverage for just regular business interruption. A lot of those uh, coverage issues have not been successful so far. Um, you know, there's been some talk about, you know, maybe some of the state governments going in and taking in. So you know, about uh, when SARS when SARS happened, like about 10 years ago, a lot of insurance companies started putting in pandemic policy coverage because there was a lot of loss. The insurance companies had a lot of losses uh, over that time. So uh, a lot of companies don't have that coverage in there, unfortunately. So, uh, you know, the ones that do are, are well situated, but you have to, you know, most of the time you have to, you know, particularly ask for it and make sure you have a rider in your policy to cover pandemic coverage. You know, interesting, interesting enough, uh, with insurance law analytics, they actually have a pub they, they publish like a, a study uh, with respect to, you know, litigation and, you know, they have a COVID coverage litigation tracker. And since, you know, COVID happened, uh, they're already up to like 1,100 lawsuits have been filed through August 15th. And of their 1,100 lawsuits on the COVID uh, coverage litigation tracker, approximately 85% of it have been for lost business income, and then 75% of involved loss extra expenses. Uh, some of the other issues too that you know, on the litigation side, because there's clearly been a big increase in litigation work. Uh, there's a lot of breach of contract lawsuits right now that are being filed that companies are involved with. So typically the companies would be using their force majeure clause as a basis not to perform the contract. So you see that with a lot of real estate disputes, uh, people that have bad supplier vendor contracts, maybe they're trying to get out of the contracts in COVID, you know, most contracts have a force majeure clause in them. So that's sometimes you'll see companies trying to take advantage of that. Uh, you're also seeing a lot of class action lawsuits. So you kind of have some involving safety standards lawsuits where, you know, the employees, you know, maybe it involves, you know, employees in the workplace and or consumers on safety standards. Uh, you're also seeing a lot of consumer protection lawsuits involving unfair pricing or failure to provide refunds for canceled concert events. And then the last area you, you see a lot of is the class action on securities violations. Um, and additionally, you know, business valuation world has really changed a lot right now. Um, you know, because you, you know, historically, when you value a company uh, in a, you know, you know, when you value a company, normally you'll take a look at the past and value, you know, you know, rely on the past to value the, you know, the company. Well, you know, COVID's really required us as valuation practitioners to change our methodologies. So, for example. You almost have to do a, you know, look at what the discounted future cash flows are going to be because it's so hard to rely on the past as a basis for the future after COVID happened. So if you have a valuation that occurred after, you know, late February of 2020, 
uh, you're going to have to, you know, do a discounted cash flow sort of method to evaluate the company's cash flows and things like that. And with all the additional risk and the speculation inherent in those cash flows, uh, that risk will need to be captured, you know, in the discount rate. And the other thing you're seeing too with, you know, value in the valuation world, it's really hard to value companies using market data right now because when you take the pre-COVID world, you know, if there's market transactions from, you know, prior to February of 2020, it's hard to rely on those pricing multiples to value companies after then. So you have to make some adjustments and sometimes there's just not enough data yet to have, you know, post-COVID pricing data. So, you know, if you don't have a situation where the companies has, you know, publicly traded guideline companies you can use to value the company under a market approach, it's pretty tough to, uh, you know, you can't just mix and mash uh, how you do evaluation uh, with respect to the earnings base versus the pricing multiples. Yeah, so that's a very good point. So you'll have to go through a lot of assumptions, really. Correct. Those assumptions will need to be uh, verified somehow, uh, which is really going to be difficult for the auditors, and I'm an auditor, to, to, to get comfortable with. Exactly. The, the forecasts, you know, that's why evaluating those forecasts and the business plans and things like that, you know, because, you know, one of the problems right now is that, you know, you have some industries that are doing great, a lot of industries that are not doing great, and then some industries have not been impacted. So, you know, it really depends on, you know, the situation that you're involved with and, you know, getting comfortable with the projections on a going forward basis. And, you know, one of the things when you talk about the assumptions is really, you know, what is the, you know, financing capacity of the company? You know, what is the ability of the company to kind of withstand this uh, economic, you know, situation that we're in? You know, when we hear, you know, our first speaker today talk about it could be another nine years, it just shows you how challenging, you know, how much, you know, are these you know, valuations going to be impacted for private, you know, I'm mostly involved in privately held litigation. So, you know, if I'm going to do a shareholder litigation, it's going to be, you know, I'm going to have to take into account, you know, this, you know, troubling economic scenario for the next 10 years. And then it's probably going to make people, you know, reduce their projections down. And if companies don't have a good track record yet, uh, it could be challenging. And this year, you know, with companies, you know, if you have evaluation dates that are, you know, before COVID, it's not necessarily a big deal, but the valuation date issue is just a huge deal now, because if you have anything after February of 2020, you really have to evaluate the impact of COVID on the valuation. Interesting. So can we go back to the insurance claims and litigations that you mentioned? And can you talk a, a little bit more about uh, what are the key considerations for determining the loss period? for yes. your clients involved in COVID insurance claims? Yeah, uh, there's lots of things that you have to consider when you look at the loss period. And, and one of the things, you know, when you're involved with, you know, analyzing insurance claims for business interruption, you know, the, you know, the insurance carriers always hire their own expert as well as the policyholders. So, you know, it's important that you actually go through uh, with your forensic account in determining what the loss period is and also go through with your attorney that's involved with, you know, because, you know, forensic accounts generally you know, are hired by many times directly by uh, the law firms that they're doing work for. So, you know, typically what we look for when, you know, in the loss period, it really just depends on the you know, situation that you're involved in. So in business interruption claims, typically the loss period is gonna be measured from the beginning date of the loss event until the sales or profits of the subject business have recovered or stabilized. In uh, a breach of contract case, the loss period is generally going to be measured from the date of the alleged wrongdoing through the termination date of the contract. So if the contract you know, dispute had early termination or non-renewal issues, the loss period might be late, you know, based on legal counsel's uh, interpretation of the contract. And if the parties have a history of renewals or there's been assurances regarding future renewals, maybe the loss of period may potentially extend beyond the term of the contract. And if you have a situation, you know, some businesses from COVID have been permanently destroyed so in those situations, your loss period is indefinite. So normally the measure of damages when you've been permanently destroyed is not lost business income. It's really based on the diminution of value of the business instead of lost profits. So some of the key factors that we would look into in analyzing co you know, what the loss period is as a result of COVID specific factors. Uh, you know, we always ask our clients to give us the supporting documentation for support, you know, for the specific dates that the sales and operations were impacted by COVID-19. So what were the government mandated shutdowns? What were the potential you know, known COVID related exposure shutdowns? Uh, what's the reduced capacity of the business? Uh, we're also gonna review the loss provisions 
you know, other relevant insurance policies. You know, that's really a critical area. In cases involving insurance claims, the you know the insurance policies really dictate the analysis that we're going to perform, whether you know in terms of the lost business income as well as the lost period. So we're going to look at you know you know business interruption, property, civil authority, supply chain coverage, uh, infectious disease coverage, and so on. Uh, we also need to review the key terms of important contracts that you had that may impact your operations, such as customer leases, suppliers, and other vendors. Uh, we also want to look at the geography impact of the local, state, and federal regulations and, man and mandates that are impacting the business during COVID-19. You know, I'm in the Midwest, so I do a lot of work in Illinois, Missouri, Iowa, uh, Texas. Uh, so in the Midwest, you know, it really depends on the states, you know, which, you know, the, you know some of the states like Missouri and Iowa are a lot more open than states like Illinois. Uh, you know, in addition, you want to evaluate the financial condition of the business prior to the start of COVID-19, analyze the ability of the business to get financing, uh, including the you know, paycheck protection funds and other government disaster recovery and stimulus funds that are available. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, you have to remember when you do an analysis like this, it has to be based on, you know, the impact of the COVID-19 issue. So you have to analyze, you know, so if there's losses from other industry, consumer behavior and economic trends and outlook, those things have to be accounted for in the analysis. So, uh, and then some of the other things that we look at are the ability for the business to mitigate or offset their damages from insurance. Uh, so we'd also want to take a look at, you know, their weekly and monthly financial statements in the current year versus the prior three or four years. Uh, and then we also want to evaluate the business plans, marketing plans, budgets, forecasts, and or projections of the subject business. An interesting thing that I kind of get involved with in some of my litigation cases too is like, you know, you know, if you have a litigation case right now, like if I'm hired on a trade secrets litigation and I can't, you know, and I have to do a damage calculation, you know, I have to be able to apportion between, you know, the wrongdoing and what COVID-19 impacted the business. So in cases that really are unrelated to COVID-19, there could be situations that require a lost profits of a business to be allocated between COVID-19 factors and non-COVID-19 factors. So uh, you know, with, you know, with, you know, financial results coming in for companies, it's really an interesting time in terms of how we're going to do that sort of apportionment. Okay, interesting. Uh, so actually, we have a question for you, Sean. Uh, I'm going to read it out loud. Sure, um, sure. Have you had business interruption cases where the company had the specific pandemic writer that have made it all the way through and had, had been settled? Yes, I have had those cases, yes involving COVID-19, yes. Yes, you know, none of my clients have, have had that um, type of a writer. So, you know, I, I wonder how people without uh, somebody, uh, like an expert like yourself, quantify those uh, lost, uh, that lost business income. It's, it's, it's a very complicated calculation. Yes, and, it, and it, like I said, and, it, and that's why I say normally, you know, we try to wait before we, you know, analyze, you know, because it ultimately it's trying to figure out you know, with the loss period, it's really unknown, you know, is it going to be a one month, two month or two year? And so ultimately the policy is going to, you know, state what the maximum length of the loss period is with respect to that. And that's what, you know, one of the challenges right now, because no one really knows how long this is going to impact uh, businesses that, uh, that we're in. Uh, but generally speaking, you know, lost profits are going to be calculated by comparing the financial performance of the businesses uh, pre-impairment to the financial performance of the business post-impairment, and then adjusting for the impact of other, you know, to the business related, unrelated to the impairment, such as like changes in new competition, you know, industry market, economic conditions, things like that. Well, so thank you, Sean, for your input. We're going to move to Tom um, to give him an opportunity to talk about his perspective, which is completely different uh, because Tom comes to us, uh, he's a repeat of tax of national Cinema Media um, since 2019, uh, 2009, and he's also a professor of the University, University of Denver graduate tax program. Uh, so Tom, are you on? Yes. Okay. Uh, great to have you. Thank you so much for being here. I have a few questions for you. Sure. And the first question is, how has COVID-19 pandemic affected your company specifically and the movie exhibition business in general? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me today. Um, so National Cinemedia is a movie theater advertising company that's owned 48% by the public. 
through a holding company, NCMI, and were traded on NASDAQ. And the balance of the company is owned by the three largest theater circuits in the world, Cineworld, which in the US owns the Regal and United Artists Theaters, AMC and Cinemark. Um, our customers are advertisers like Coca-Cola or candy companies like Mars, Google, Apple, Geico, Kia, and then large Madison Avenue advertising companies. And we're entirely, our business is entirely dependent on our exhibition partners being open. So all of you probably remember um, Thursday, March 12th, that was the night that the NBA, the Center for the Utah Jazz came out and it announced he had COVID-19. President Trump implemented the European travel restrictions. And then Tom Hanks and his wife announced they had COVID, um, they had tested positive for COVID-19. So March 13th, the next day was a Friday and all of our theater exhibition partners closed on that day and re have remained generally sh uh, shuttered until uh, around Labor Day when uh, most of them reopened for the release of the movie Tenet. So we were kind of depending on Tenet and then other movies in Q3 and Q4 to, um, to, to show. And the, so we depend on our exhibition partners being open, but the exhibition partners are dependent on the theaters or the movie slate provided by the movie uh, studios. And you've probably heard that the movie studios are moving releases, have moved, moved releases out of Q3 and Q4 of 2020 to either 2021 or straight to premium uh, video on demand streaming. So examples would be like James Bond, the new James Bond movie, Wonder Woman, and um, Disney's Mulan. And as a result of the studios moving their releases, Regal, which had reopened prior to Labor Day, closed again. Most of their theaters across the world, October 8th, and its parent company, Cineworld, which is a UK company, also abandoned uh, its proposed acquisition of the Canadian movie exhibitor, Cineplex. Um, and then we're well aware of in the last week or so, various states and cities have begun reimposing stri stringent lockdown rules, which are impacting the movie exhibition business. Uh, Washington State, Michigan, California, Chicago, et cetera. Just to give you an idea of the impact on our financial performance, we were projecting revenue for 2020 of 467 million, but at this point we're only anticipating around 90 million of revenue with the bulk of that earned in Q1 prior to the COVID pandemic. Uh, we also had forced, forecasted EBITDA of 207 million for the full year 2020 but now anticipate EBITDA of negative 22.3 million. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So we're pretty much completely shut down um, mm -hmm. through, you know, Q4 we're anticipating to be a little bit better, but uh, with all these shutdowns and lockdowns, we're, um, you know, we're, it, it's getting a little bit more negative. Um, and you know, as a result of all of that, we've run into issues because we're a public company during Q2 and Q3 of potential impairment of some of our assets for gap purposes, as well as the potential bankruptcy of one of our founding members, which is AMC that, that's been in the news. Um, and in addition to that, we've also had to deal with supporting the realizability of our net DTAs from an ASC 740 perspective, as well as we have a $200 million tax receivable agreement liability on our balance sheet as of Q3 2020. So there's a question of, um, will that ever be settled entirely? And so for right now, we were able to support our DTAs and the fact that we would settle that liability 
as of Q3, but we're facing additional challenges uh, with that um, coming into Q4, as well as the fact that we had to put going concern language into our uh, form 10Q for Q3 2020 related to um, our, it is in our liquidity, it's, we're currently in violation of some, we had negotiated a credit waiver because we've got $1.1 billion of debt. And back in May, we had negotiated a credit waiver to be in violation or out of compliance with our leverage ratios for a period of a year. And so looking um, from Q3, looking to the end of that credit waiver period, we anticipate still being in violation of those leverage ratios. So we had to put in going concern language in our uh, 10Q. We're working with our bankers to extend that credit waiver two or three more quarters to come back into compliance. So um, we've had all, although we haven't been busy from uh, a business perspective, certainly my team here internally and our financial accounting group, our financial reporting group and our legal group have been very busy. Yes, well, thank you for sharing this perspective. Uh, you were definitely tremendously negatively impacted by, by yes. COVID. Uh, so to follow up on this first question that I asked, what steps um, have you taken to weather the storm? I mean, I understand you talked to your creditor about uh, some of the covenants, uh, waiver of the covenants. What other, other things have you done to emerge as a viable company? Yeah. So the first thing we did was we drew down on our revolving credit facility uh, for liquidity purposes. As I mentioned, we negotiated a credit a waiver to our credit agreement. Um, we worked hard at collecting our trade receivables that were around 171 million in comparison at Q3 2019. And now we've collected a lot of that and we have our trade receivables down to 11 million as of Q3 2020. We alerted our vendors that we were extending payment of our um, uh, accounts payable amounts. And we've implemented, you know, a cash conservation program, looked at all of our expenses as well. And then we've implemented several waves of furloughs and layoffs starting in April. And then again, we felt comfortable enough at the kind of in the middle of August to bring a lot of people back from that first wave of layoffs. But then when the exhibition, the movie exhibition business didn't pick up again um, in Q3 and, and anticipated in Q4, plus with the with Regal closing its doors, we ended up laying, furloughing people and laying some people off again uh, about 10 days ago. I see. Yeah. Have you taken advantage of any of the CARES Act, uh, you know, PPP? PPP? Yeah, that, um, if not the PPP, we looked at that and we were too large to take advantage yeah. of that. Um, we have, uh, and we're working on the employee retention credit. Uh, we're eligible for that, but because we have greater than 500 employees, there's a lot of restrictions on that. So my team has been working on that over the past few months. We've taken advantage of the uh, deferral of the payroll tax amounts and then some of the tax specific changes, income tax specific changes in the CARES Act, the qualified improvement property change. Uh, we filed a form 3115, a change uh, in accounting method with our 2019 return. And then the advantageous um, changes to the 163J business interest expense limitation. We've taken advantage of that some of that in 2019 and then in 2020 as well. And we're, um, we're looking forward to potential benefits of the next round of COVID relief being taken up by Congress, hopefully soon, either during the lame duck session or after uh, January 20th. Uh, one of the other things I just wanted to note this pandemic is, you know, maybe from a positive standpoint, it's forced us to look at some other 
Um, so the business we're in broadly is called out of home advertising. So this is um, the pandemic has caused us to really focus on some other opportunities that we're exploring um, in other avenues of out of home advertising. So we've got a whole group internally that's that are looking at some of those opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yep. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about how you're, you're pivoting um, a bit to, to, to weather the storm. So where do you see yourself in 2021, 2022 and, and going forward, uh, you and the, the movie exhibition industry in general? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the pandemic, as it has with a lot of different industries, has accelerated certain trends we've been witnessing over the last several years. And one is the theatrical release window. So that's the period of time between when movies are released in theater and then when they're available streaming. You probably saw in the news a month or so ago, AMC had gotten into um, an argument with Universal uh, dating back. Um, it actually went public in the middle of the summer where AMC said they, would, they will not show Universal studio movies and then they finally reached an agreement um, a couple months back that um, and agreed on a 17 day the theatrical release window and then just uh, this week Cinemark uh, reached a similar deal it's it's more advantageous actually with Universal uh, for a 17 day or a 31 day uh, theatrical release window. So those kind of things have been accelerated. We're seeing this impacts our business is reserved seating. So we count on people being in the movie theater prior to the beginning of the showing of the trailers to see our advertising. And with reserved seating, which is available in a lot of theaters, that period of time that people maybe are loitering prior to the beginning of the trailers has been cut down. So we anticipate that um, to, to accelerate for our, our particular business. And I was really shocked when I started working for National Cinemedia 11 and a half years ago at how the exhibition business wasn't really consolidated. There's obviously the big players, but in addition to our three main um, exhibition partners, we have 35 other affiliates we do business with. So there's quite a few kind of mom and pop operations out there in the exhibition business. And I expect those to be to consolidate quickly. Some of them are going um, bankrupt as we speak. And I think also this whole pandemic has really exposed some of our partner business partners, particularly AMC. They have um, big debt problems. They have bad balance sheets. So to Cine World, Cinemark, on the other hand, has generally come through this very strong. They have a very healthy balance sheet, not a lot of debt. And then as, as several people have, have mentioned the vaccine news, we see that as very positive, something um, to look forward to and certainly in 2021. And I feel confident that our business is going to weather this. Um, it's going to be different, probably smaller, but uh, we'll come through, I think, healthier ultimately in the end. Well, thank you so much, Tom, for sharing your perspective. Uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting to see um, where your industry is at right now and how you're pivoting and changing and uh, consolidation and uh, some bankruptcies and it's, it's uh, hopefully it's, it's going to get better and the vaccines that are available now, uh, well, at least not available, but at least I've heard about two that are out there. Yeah. And uh, it will uh, get a little, a little better. Yeah, it, it's been nothing if not, um, you know, very challenging and it, it has certainly hasn't been dull at all during the last eight months or so. Yes, I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I will go back to the audience. So we have about 10 minutes left for Q&A. Uh, we do have one question in the chat uh, asking about the tax deadline. And I don't have the answer for that, whether the tax deadline is going to be 
I moved from April 15th uh, late to later on. Um, last year it was extended, so I'm assuming that it will be the same, but I don't think we have an answer here at our panel, unless somebody knows. Um, there is one question. It's, it's about oil prices. So basically, what do you see, John, for oil prices and the timeline for the oil energy sector's recovery? Yeah, oil, oil prices are notoriously difficult to predict. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I would say that, you know, they'll probably track uh, the global economy. Um, I don't see anything else that would cause them to move you know, short of, short of some sort of conflict, which, you know, hopefully won't erupt amid the pandemic. Um, I would expect that oil prices will move uh, upward as the economy, as the global economy, not just the U.S. economy, but as the global economy continues its recovery. Hey, Larissa, I think you've got your, your um, audio off. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was talking, thinking that you can hear me, but um, yeah, I was just saying thank you, John. I have another question for 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 John and uh, anybody there who wants to ask questions. This is the this is your opportunity to ask questions for the next seven minutes. So I'm curious, John, how did our policy response, uh, particular fiscal response to the pandemic, compare to that of other countries? Yeah, so I, I think it was different in in uh, many respects, but one is really important. Um, we decided to distribute pandemic relief through the unemployment insurance system, um, which is woefully outdated and uh, didn't you know clearly didn't have the capacity, uh, especially in states like California and Florida, to handle the deluge. Um, and in doing that, you know, we, we did two things. One, we, we, we caused money to get out slower to people than it might otherwise have. Um, two, we perhaps overcompensated a lot of people. Um, and three, we severed the relationship between the employer and the employee. Um, other countries, Denmark in particular, uh, handled it differently. Um, you know, rather than having a PPP and the unemployment insurance, um, Denmark uh, paid firms 70% uh, of the pay payroll for workers that they were going to furlough. So the companies would keep continue paying workers 70% of their salary, but tell them stay at home and you can't work. Um, and the Danish government was picking up the tab. Um, the, the benefit of that uh, is that uh, when it comes time to reopen, you just call those folks and say, come on back in and you restore 100% of their, their pay. Uh, you don't have to find them. You don't have to risk the fact that the possibility that they will have gone and found another job. Um, so I think that probably reopening uh, will be easier in Denmark than in the United States. Um, that said, economists are going to be you know, investigating just that question for, for years to come. It's interesting you mentioned that. But I was just talking to a client of mine uh, re regarding PPP loan. Mm -hmm. And the PPP mm -hmm. loan was this panacea that everybody kind of hold, held on to. And apply for if they could. But the problem is now that there's this questionnaire that they, uh, that uh, was released by SBA, I believe, uh, that basically questions whether you were eligible for the PPP loan to begin with and whether you're going to get it forgiven, even if you spent it 100% on payroll to, to do exactly what this loan was for, to, to retain people. And so, so I'm just curious uh, how that's going to develop. Yeah, it, it, that, that's a good question. I, I don't really know, but it, but it's you know it's, it's in keeping with with everything uh, having to do with PPP. I mean, PPP was was administered incredibly inefficiently. You know, why run it through the SBA, you know, which didn't have the capacity to deal with it, and then run it through banks who, you know, they they benefit from giving out large loans because they're they're paid a percentage of the loan. So why not give out one large loan instead of ten small ones? And so the money went to large companies that arguably didn't need it. Um, hugely inequitable um, and enormous. No, well, very, very few black owned small businesses receive PPP funds. Um, only about 30% of small businesses that, that needed additional funds actually got money from PPP. Um, so, you know, it's, it, when Congress moves quickly, it moves inefficiently. And PPP is probably you know, exhibit A uh, in making that argument. 
Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and, and now the, the forums that you're talking about are probably trying to, you know, undo some of the inefficiency, but it's going to be enormously costly to folks who were led astray. Exactly. Well, that, that questionnaire is at least uh, 10 pages long. So, uh, you know, yeah, somebody right. will have to know how to fill it out, and there's going to be a lot of confusion about that. It's ridiculous. So what, we have one question in the chat. Um, Sherry is asking, nine years to full recovery, so you don't think the creation of new industries from COVID is enough to offset the bankruptcy of others? Um, well, I'd be curious to know what Sherry thinks those other industries are. I mean, Zoom you know, has taken off. Uh, you know, exist, a lot of existing industries have, have been bolstered for sure. Uh, you know, Amazon. Um, delivery of goods, sure, yes. Delivery of goods, that's interesting though because that completely offsets uh, reduction in brick and mortar retail. Not completely, but largely. Um, so I, I, I and others are, are, are not very sanguine about new industries or expansion of existing industries because of COVID to offset um, the small business losses that we're going to incur. And, and we're going to incur the small business losses, you know, not, not just during COVID, but after COVID, because an enormous number of them will be in a more financially precarious position going forward, um, making it harder ultimately to survive. Thank you. And, and Sean, for you, it's going to be a full employment act for the valuations and uh, the forensic work and the losses and all that. It's just a lot of lots of work for accountants, for sure. Don't you think so? Yes, there's definitely going to be a lot of uh, you know litigation and uh, insurance policy disputes going forward on these issues, and you know that are going to need to quantify the business losses. You know, because you're going to have substantial business losses and. You know, with the damage period that you know is a lot longer than a typical situation. Yes. Well, thank you, everybody. We're almost down to the minute. Uh, to, it's almost two thirty here at Pacific time. I wanted to thank Tom, Sean, and John for their time and for their wisdom. Uh, it was interesting for me to listen to, and I hope uh, everybody benefited from this discussion. Thank you. Thank you for having me as well. Thanks, uh, for thanks Larissa. Pleasure. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, John. If anybody thanks. wants to jump in, I don't know if you guys still have a few more minutes. If anybody has any questions, feel free to virtually raise your hand. We can get you into the, the networking function here. I, I enjoyed the conversation. It kind of brought me back to earlier in my career as a corporate controller in 2001. You know, everybody thinks September 11th kind of tanked the economy, but really the technology industry started to drop in, in March of that year. Um, you know, then I relocated out here in 2008 to the Bay Area, you know, during the next, you know, kind of slowdown. So, you know, I think the moral of the story is, you know, we roll up our sleeves, but we'll get through it. Um, you know, but I appreciate the insight that you guys all had had to provide because, you know, everybody's making shifts and, and adjustments along the way. And you know, that's a good observation, Bill. We, we, we do live in a, in a very facile economy, one that adapts pretty easily. Um, you know, the workers, not always so much. And uh, so we need to do more pr to protect workers. But, uh, but, you know, yes, we'll be back. And we'll be strong. Yeah, and it kind of ties have... back into, I think, what Larry and some of our earlier conversations today, right? You know, we got to be there for each other. You know, I mean, there's going to come a time, I think, when we all, we all need that helping hand, right? And I think this is one of those times where, um, you know, there's a lot of people out there, you know, not, and not just business-wise, right? I mean, there's people that are, being stretched um, across the board. But when Tom shared his numbers from, you know, what was it, 400 plus million to 90, that's a big, uh, <laughs> that's a big shift, um, you know. For sure. And, you know, impacts a lot of people. We have one more question. I don't know if John, if you can answer that real quick. Analysts predict a robust stock market in 2021 and 22 uh, with the next six months being choppy. Is that a fair analysis or not? Um, yeah, uh, entirely plausible. Um, I think the next six months will certainly be choppy. Uh, the next year might be choppy. We'll, we'll probably have fits and starts in various aspects of the recovery, um, including uh, the, the, the application of vaccines. Um, you know, the information now is, is really, really rosy um, but uh, on vaccines, but we've moved super quickly with new technologies and it's entirely possible that there might be fits and starts and that will be reflected in the stock market. So the next six months to a year might be bumpy, but uh, yeah, it's, it's really hard to see beyond that um, what would really cause the stock market not to be sort of steady. 
Well, thank you all. Yeah, no, absolutely. Any other Thanks. questions for, for Sean or John? I mean, obviously they've got, and Larissa, a wealth of, a wealth of knowledge. Um, I'm sure if they all had a crystal ball, they would tell us exactly when, you know, everything will be back to quote unquote normal. If only we could. Amen. Or, or, or maybe the better question is, when are we going to be done to redefining what normal looks like? Um, you know, but this is, this is a tremendous topic. All right, guys. Well, we'll let you get going. I'll, I'll wrap up here with a few quick announcements. But again, you know, John, Sean, Larissa, I know Tom had a bounce. Really, thank you for your time. Thank you for your continued support of Tax Forward. I'm sure if you guys have any follow-up questions, though, feel free to um, shoot them to, to myself, Jordan. We can definitely get you in touch with, um, with the speakers today. So thank you very much, guys. We really appreciate it. Thanks, thank for you. Having you. Pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye.